Good afternoon, my name is Michael Bowen. If you haven't met me already, one of the topics I want to talk about today is how do we protect investors? How do investors protect their own money, specifically when they're investing into property? And to help us with that, I've actually brought along Bruno Samal from Bruno Samal Attorneys. Now, just to give a bit of our background in, in, in relation to him, we've done conveyance, we've done illegal with him, we've done installment sale agreements, back to backs. He's given us advice on partnerships from the memorandum of his incorporation, uh, through his memorandum of understanding. We've done advice on evictions we've spoken about. We've done structures and set up the whole course. So without further ado, uh, Bruno, please, um, let me just remove my pen over here. Could you introduce yourself, say hello, and introduce oh. please, and your company. Well, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mike. Hi, Jacques. It's good, it's good to be chatting to you guys again. Um, so very brief introduction. Um, so as you said, I'm, my name is Bruno. I wear two hats normally. Um, on the one side, I am an attorney at Bruno Sima Attorneys. Um, this specializes in the commercial space, especially when it comes to property. So we focus a lot on assisting property investors, property owners, anything from your evictions, conveyancing, uh, putting contracts together, making deals work, deal making, that sort of thing. Um, and that's typically where I pride myself on is the deal making side of things. Um, it's the negotiating, putting it together, and then just making sure that everyone walks out the door um, yeah, making money effectively. Then uh, my other hat is through Intigen. Um, the, these two uh, companies do complement each other. Intigen focuses also on planning. So I'm very much involved in the strategic space. Yeah, but Intigen particularly likes uh, the tax planning side of things, the structuring side of things. So here we start having conversations on what should a person's um, investment vehicles look like, their investment structure in total, what should be in there, how money should move around from one to the other what sort of protections you need to look out for um, all the way from level one your personal capacity all the way down to every single spv that you use and again it ties back into bruno smart attorneys where we start speaking about partnerships and yeah and and joint ventures and the like nice and i mean i know you personally as well this is nothing new for you this has been going on for years you've got a, quite a yeah. complement of people working with you i've dealt with leonora alexa um shilly boy i don't even know how else but i'm pretty sure the the breadth of your experience or collective experience is quite vast by now and quite a number of years as well sure yeah um so since um so i've been in the legal space since 2007 um in the property space almost uh, exclusively in the commercial space from about 2008, 2009. And since then, properties have basically been my core focus within the commercial space. So that's 15 years of experience. Basically, yeah. you know your stuff. And, and we can attest yes. that as well. We can firmly attest yeah. that. So one of the things I really, really, <laughs> I really want to get into, and I, I want to do more of these kind of things, because installment sale agreement by themselves need their own kind of 15 20 minutes dedicated to that and so do the back-to-backs but today's one is around investors how do they protect themselves and specifically i want to talk about loan agreements why would an investor who's about to loan money why would they need one and how does it actually serve and protect that investor when he's going into a loan agreement deal to fund into a property investment deal could you elaborate on that please sure no worries so I suppose it's something it, uh, what merits or what's worthy of mention is there's two ways that people typically get into relationships together. Um, even if it's you call it what you want to call it, a stock file, a partnership, it, all of that is just basically a label for um, some kind of underlying structure, right? And the reality is when you go into this type of relationship, you either invest with some form of equity, so capital for equity, so that's a share. So a share in a partnership, officially it's not called a share, but you get the idea, you're involved, there's a contribution, you get something out of it. A share in a company, we all know what a share in a company is, a membership in some sort of association. Um, this normally entails the taking of some form of risk. You're putting in money and you're taking a risk that you might not get this money back. The idea isn't to have the money repaid, it's to um, grow value in a business or an investment. And eventually at some point, if you sell out of it, you've created some sort of asset of value um, so your growth is dependent on that um, now so the equity versus debt conversation the debt conversation is more guaranteed 
um, in the debt conversation, you want your money back. You want some form of guarantee that you're going to get the money back plus whatever you want your profits to be. And that's normally in the form of interest. Uh, we don't need to get complex now. There is an in-between or in-the-middle option uh, that you'll see with the JSC and that sort of thing where they mix bonds and equity and they put it together and they link to each other. Um, but typically speaking within the property space, you don't get that, you don't have to get that complex. People either choose the less riskier option of getting their money back or the higher risk of actually investing in the business and watching it grow. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, sure. And on the loan agreement side, so I'm an investor now, I'm going to loan money into a, a company and we do that from, from a Zeno Homes perspective, we have investors come work with us and we provide them a loan agreement. How does that loan agreement protect that investor? What is the nuts and bolts of that loan agreement? Sure. Right. So uh, loan agreements in South Africa are governed typically by the National Credit Act. National Credit Act came out uh, like a decade ago, uh, trying to protect consumers' rights. The same way that the Consumer Protection Act does, but the National Credit Act is focused entirely on credit. Uh, this means that your banks, your micro lenders, that sort of thing, um, have to uh, comply with very strict rules. Uh, when it comes to actually lending money. So this involves things, for example, like um, proper vetting, uh, because there is such a thing as reckless credit. So if you see someone that you shouldn't be giving money to, don't give them money. Because if you do, um, the, the court could actually find that it was reckless and could nullify it, as an example. Uh, there's also a lot of consumer protection mechanisms within the act that deal, for instance, with somebody that might be over indebted um, on credit agreements that could approach the court and ask for debt review, uh, which basically allows the court to make orders on repayment of the debt uh, that goes contrary to the terms of the agreement. So, you know, reduce the repayment amounts and uh, prolong the repayment over a period of time. So that's the purpose of the act. It's very consumer centric. Um, and obviously for a lot of the big guys, it makes sense. So your banks, they're fully compliant, National Credit Act, you know, 100%, they have to do proper vetting and the like. Now, what's funny is there's a reason for that. And it actually, it, it's that the act isn't all bad because a lot of people approach me and the first question is, how do I make sure that my loan falls outside the act? And that already starts worrying me because I get why you'd want it to fall outside the act. And this is why we're having this conversation. So loan agreements, uh, in the past, there used to be certain thresholds. So you'd have a certain amount of loan agreements or a certain value, and only above that value would, it, uh, would you have to comply with the National Credit Act. Unfortunately, at some point, they dropped this to zero a couple of years back which means that everyone got confused because, because now at any point, if you lend money to someone and you charge a fee for the deferral of the payment, so all that means is you're getting some kind of return for the longer, the longer that the, the, the amount remains outstanding. And as soon as that fee is levied, it's considered credit. And as soon as it's credit, you're expected to comply with the act. And a lot of people understand this and go, well, now the threshold is zero. So everyone, everyone in loan agreements now need to comply with the National, uh, National Credit Act. Um, it, to the point where I recall a court case that seemed rather simple. Um, a, a, a gentleman was lending money to one of his employees, if I'm not mistaken, just helping the guy out and charged interest on it as a good, good faith interest. It wasn't even a high interest amount. And at some point, the employee took this to court and nullified the agreement because unfortunately, yes, it seemed to be a very friendly transaction. And there used to be talk about if it's only if it's within your course of business would the NCA apply and the courts went, well, it, nothing in the act says that. So loan is a loan, you're paying interest, falls within the act. So now moving from there, we all understand that the act applies almost from the bat. And so people approach me and say, well, how do we get out of the act applying? Now, the reason they ask that isn't just all the strict uh, requirements that you need to comply with, but it's also the registration as a credit provider. This is a bit of a process. So if you want to lend money, but it's not your primary course of business, to have to go get uh, you know, uh, criminal clearance certificates and 
uh, th there's a certain assessment that they undertake, a couple of months, a fee that you have to pay. Uh, you know, you have to display a certificate in your office in a particular way. It's, it's cumbersome. So a lot of guys don't necessarily want to do this. Um, but what they need to remember, and this is where I start getting worried, is I get that you don't want to do it because of the registration. But remember, some of the requirements in terms of the act may actually help you. It requires you to pay attention to the money, uh, to the person that you're giving money to. Because if you don't vet them, it's always going to be a risk. You could have the best drafted agreement. But if you're giving money to someone that is not going to pay you back and it's going to go gamble it away and has 10 judgments against their name, don't expect the best drafted agreement to help you, right? And the act kind of enforces that idea that people should be careful and they do it from a consumer perspective. Don't give this guy more money because he's only going to get into more trouble, but it also plays on the lender's perspective where don't give the guy more money you're not going to get it back if you do um so that so, so that kind of now uh, um, starts dealing with the question what what do now lenders do especially in the property space um, because of this now they want to lend money they're not national credit uh, national credit providers and the history now comes to the, the, I don't know, like in the US, they have this concept called the sophisticated investor, right? Um, all this means in the US is that above a certain amount, if, if you've got an annual turnover or salary above a certain amount, the government doesn't de deem it necessary to protect you as much. So in the financial space, you know, they, they protect people up to a certain amount. But then if you invest, they, um, a sophisticated investor, they'll say, you know what, you're not protected. You can invest in anything that you want. It doesn't have to be registered your call. And so it's a very similar concept here. So when two juristic persons are doing business with each other, the courts consider this as businesses. And because it's businesses, they start taking a step back and going, maybe we don't need to worry about you two because you two should be able to engage each other freely so that trade can flow from this. The person borrowing the money isn't a consumer in the normal sense. It's not your, your normal person that, uh, you know, on the street and they're struggling and they're trying to borrow money just to survive. It's a business. There's a business idea. At the end of the day, if the business fails, the lender you know, probably wouldn't get their money back. And this is where they started looking at drawing certain exclusions or from the application of the act and saying, well, if it's two businesses and the one business has an annual turnover or net asset value of over a million rand, you know, it's pretty sophisticated. So we don't need to worry about them. Um, they're borrowing money, but they should know what they're doing. And the person lending their money should know that as well. So we're good to go. Um, that the, the, the act doesn't apply to that. Then there's another exclusion, which is um, any loan, large loan above 250,000 Rand, uh, also to a juristic person, which also gets excluded from the ambit of the act. So those are two individual exclusions. As long as it's one person to a juristic person lending money to some sort of company, uh, those exclusions kick in. And if those exclusions kick in, the National Credit Act doesn't apply, right? And that's the logic, that's the logic behind why, uh, why it wouldn't apply the sophisticated investor approach. Unfortunately, and this is where I worry with people as well, um, if they come to me and say, how, does, how can I avoid the act from applying? I want to lend money to person A, um, but, you know, the person X, which is the individual. The, the problem I foresee there is don't go to person A and say, I won't lend money to you unless you have a company. I, I know that ultimately it's just going to be you I'm lending money to. Don't fabricate. Don't fabricate this. At the end of the day, the true nature of it is it's business to business. You're going to lend money to a business. Don't fabricate the circumstances in order to fit the exclusion out of the act because the courts might see that. And you, you obviously, and then obviously you won't be protected. So you as a lender want to make sure that the person borrowing from you fits those requirements and then you're good. Lend the money, do your assessment, but lend the money. Um, and nothing prevents you from getting surety signed, things like that. So you can still get somebody to sign as a surety. Um, but again, the, the caution is just don't try fabricate. Otherwise you might land up, uh, you might land up in more trouble. Indeed. Fantastic, Bruno. Question. So what recourse will investors have if things go pear-shaped? Um, so 
so investors as in the person lending the money, the, yes, the lender. Correct. Right. Yes. Um, so there's uh, so I suppose different different scenarios. Mm. Uh, if the credit act, if the credit act is found to apply, and you mm. um, lend money to someone, and it turns out that you should have complied, you didn't comply, uh, then recourse is a bit of a problem because you shouldn't have lent that money. And there was, was case law at a stage that said, well, the whole agreement's void, no one needs to pay anyone back. But fortunately, a case did come out through the uh, uh, Supreme Court of Appeal that, that um, confirmed that at the very least, you're entitled to your capital back, but don't expect to receive interest um, when you shouldn't have lent the money to begin with. So as a business venture, that's a no-no. Um, if the credit act doesn't apply and you guys get it right at the beginning, you draft the contracts. Now, from a recourse perspective, it becomes a question of collection. Um, and I mean, I suppose, I suppose the intuition there is if the business is making money, you'd be able to collect and issue a summons, for example, get a judgment against them and collect. Um, but, you know, so the best example, if you lend a big corporate money, a pick and pay or MTN or whatever, you know, you're pretty confident that whatever happens, if they don't repay you, it's because there's a fight about something. It's not about the uh, um, not having money available. A smaller business, on the other hand, you would have to sue, get default judgment, and then try and collect. And the risk there, and that's why I said, be very careful who you lend money to, because you don't want to try and collect from an empty shell. And that's, that's the biggest risk. And that's why you then try associate your loan agreement with some form of security in order to give you extra rights um, if it ever does come down to, to non-payment. Mm. So as a, as a personal investor, as I say, I want to lend my money to somebody, what would you recommend? Would you recommend trying to get shares into that company that you're going to be investing into and then having the shares pay out at the end? Or would you recommend going down the loan agreement route if it's outside of if I'm lending more than two hundred fifty thousand? Which is the kind of options on those two? Well, I suppose so. I suppose the reality is that's that's actually more a Michael Bowen question. So if you if you get involved in a deal and you see this thing skyrocketing and a huge amount of return being made, would you want to be invested and have equity in that deal? and and grow with it take a risk but grow with it or would you just want your money back with interest indeed and i'm talking more along the lines of just the money back with interest sure yeah so the money back with interest carries that form of guarantee so let's say you're lending money and a person uses it but they've got some sort of asset uh, within this company so money back with interest it's a great idea. You get your money back, you get interest with your money, you can sue for it, something goes wrong, you can try and sell the property, provided that it's not overly bonded, because that's that's also another risk. So provided there's an actual asset that carries some form of liquidity, um, and that's not encumbered by anything else, it's the best security that, that you can get. Um, but again, on the flip side of it, remember, if you invest into a company and you get equity from this, uh, you can very easily try and control the company if you need to control the company. So it really depends on whether you've got the time, the energy, and the experience to be able to maneuver yourself around this type of deal. Um, and if you don't and you just want to lend money, close your eyes and hope in a year, year's time or two years' time you receive it back, um, then, then obviously the safest bet is to just do a loan. Just vet, obviously, prior. Yeah. And the vetting comes in with a pretty standard kind of stuff. You know, it's got to do with experience. It's got to do with education. You want to look at the combination of that because at the end of the day, my way of looking at it with certain investors is okay. If I'm investing to somebody and they're not going to pay my money back, I know that in this day and age that I can go the public route. And that's not the nicest of route to do, but sure, it's, sure. it's a lot more damage to somebody's future of that business. If they're not paying their investors back than compared to trying to go the legal route. Um, it's like I say, it's not the nicest of routes, but, but it is what it is in a lot of ways. Um, okay, so there's two kind of routes people can go. There's the equity route, certainly in terms of the shareholding, and then there's the simpler route, which is going by the loan agreement route. Um, like I asked earlier, how many of these loan agreements ones have you actually done over the years? Is it common, common standard or is, is it not really done? No, it's thousands. It's thousands. Uh, remember, as an investor that's trying to uh, receive money from a lender, you're, you, you very often don't want to give away part of your equity. Um, you want to own 100%. So if you can get a loan at a good rate and simply pay a return and it makes financial sense and then it's gone, 
the person's out of your life. And especially with properties, a single property, you might not want too many people involved. Um, so I so hundreds, thousands of loan agreements. Um, it just it just makes it just makes things easy yeah and it's, so it is a yeah. fairly common or more than just a common yeah thing. yeah, yeah. It's something Absolutely. we get asked a lot from people who always start off and they come to us and they and they kind of say to us like you know are these loan agreements standard my answer always is mm. yeah it's pretty standard yeah. thousand and you're complex as well um yeah. Jacques, questions from your side so i want to just understand if we're I, I need clarity on one thing, Bruno, that I thought we can just touch on for everybody on the call. So with regards to the exclusions for business to business loans, I heard you say that if a loan is above 250K to a juristic person, it would not apply. Can I just understand, is that also juristic to juristic or would that be a natural person to a juristic over 250K? As, as, so the primary focus is on the consumer and not the lender. So it doesn't really matter who the lender is. Um, it has as long as the consumer is a juristic person. That's what you're looking at. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. And actually, I was not aware of that exclusion. So that sure. gives us some more uh, wiggle room for how to set up certain agreements and how to actually protect some of our juristic and natural persons that are putting in larger amounts of money. I, I think from my side, that's it for today. I know, Michael, that you have one or two questions left, so I'll leave it to you. Yeah, it's more of a, a kind of a clarity kind of question around it because some of the people we work with actually want to have equity in the business, and that's great. And we do work with that equity and loan component of it. And then there's others who literally want to be like, I want to make money, but I don't want to be involved. I want nothing to do. And, and yeah. got a couple of investors like that. So on this side of people who want to get involved in the equity side, that's pretty simple. We can bring them in as um, shareholders and that's great. And then again, on this side, we're looking at it. They're going to be more involved in saying, okay, you want to have a loan agreement. Um, one of the, the things that of course, as they're going, and that's what we were swinging back to is what we spoke about earlier is outside of the National Credit Act and why they'd want to be out of that. And it's just for clarity kind of sake, more of a question, the statement is, the reason why that is, is quite a big onus on compliance to that National Credit Act. And what is the amount that it costs a, a person to go and get registered as a national credit provider? And you say it's quite cumbersome, but you know the cost and the timeline on average right. that if someone wanted to go that route to do it? Sure. Um, so I need to I need to check again now recently uh, because obviously over time things keep changing. So uh, some departments have actually slowed down tremendously, especially after COVID. Uh, some departments have automated uh, some of the processes. Um, so during the course of last year, at the beginning of last year, I did a um, I did a registration for someone. So the problem is. Uh, actually compiling the documents is the first thing that takes a bit of time. This is now person to person. So if you dedicated a full day to compiling those documents, ab absolutely fine. Uh, but if obviously you're doing it gradually over time, applying to, to the um, criminal record center uh, for clearance certificate, that takes a couple of weeks. So a lot of the process is in time. And if uh, you know, as well as I do with property investors, oh, I have a deal today. I want to know if I can actually buy it and do a renovation um, and, and, and you don't have a couple of weeks to register. So I suppose there's a level of forethought um, that comes behind this. If you want to create a business that's founded on lending money to property investors, even if it is to a juristic person and the exclusions apply, you might want to consider actually registering just for the sake of making sure that nothing goes wrong. But if it's one of those instant deals where you're trying to 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 uh, lend money uh, very quickly, um, obviously you don't have enough time to do it. So it takes weeks, weeks, months sometimes to um, uh, to get the registration. From a cost perspective, I suppose it depends whether you're doing it yourself or whether you're doing it through some kind of service provider. If you're doing it yourself, the cost is minimal because it's just a registration fee. So that's um, you know, so that's like a th uh, uh, sorry, I don't have the figure on um, from the top of my mind, but like a couple of k. Um, and then there's renewals and that sort of thing. If you do it through a service provider, which is often what people do, because you don't want to get caught through the bureaucracy and red tape, and then obviously it costs a lot higher because, well, you know, they're also making a living and they're standing in the queues for you. 
And you yeah. also do that as well, don't you? You do kind of walk. I do. Yeah. You do, hundred yeah. um, percent. I have to say it's on one of my core my core things that I do daily, but um, it's not it's not difficult to do because we have done it a number of times. And so let's look, look from an investor point of view now. So they're actually going to be loaning more than 250,000 Rand to a juristic entity, and therefore they kind of fall outside of that National Credit Act. Um, what is then the detriment to them that they fall outside? What does they lose by not being part of that National Credit Act? Um, so the lender or the borrower? From the lender, sorry. The lender sorry. side. Look, so the lender doesn't necessarily lose much in themselves uh, because the reality is they're uh, uninhibited. So they can, they're basically just lending money. The normal rules of contract apply. Uh, so the National Credit Act, for the most part, doesn't favor the lender or give them any extra rights that they wouldn't normally have versus the consumer who lacks the, the necessary protections. The consumer will be the one that wouldn't be able to uh, apply for debt review or wouldn't be able to uh, rely on certain provisions in order to delay the payments, wouldn't be able to uh, rely on reckless, uh, it being reckless debt, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, the lender, the lender would be good. The lender is absolutely fine. It's more the borrower that actually takes more on the risk because at the end of the day, he can then have the lender could then sue the borrower and the borrower's got no kind of recourse. He's just basically, he's got to do it. Which is actually good from a lender perspective a great point from a lender perspective yeah. bruno thank you so much for this um i hope it clarifies for people exactly the kind of the ins and the outs of actually borrowing um and lending money it's not as simple as everyone that kind of thinks it is i've seen people out there just willy-nilly almost on a piece of paper just lending mm. which is it's kind of i just look at it and go wow no we want to have proper agreements in place Bruno, thank you so much for your time. I will be in touch in the future looking at installment sale agreements in one section and a back to back as well for those who are very interested in that section. And again, you guys do that as well. So I'm sure there'll be people in touch with you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Thanks Bruno. Thanks, Bruno. Here we go.